We started with finding nerves in a triceratops condyle, which is the bone at the base of the skull, which lets the triceratops rotate his head. That big ball-shaped condyle, we dissolved that and found nerves in it. We published that, and they put it on the cover of the journal. So we're, we're now being recognized for the work, which I think is very rewarding, but more importantly, this is for everybody to know. This is not something that only a few people should know about. The whole world needs to know that all of these creatures and all of these deposits have blood clots in them. They have nerves in them. Therefore, they cannot be old and they must have drowned because they have clots. That, that's a condition. That's a known medical condition called DIC. And when you drown, if you die in drowning, all your blood clots throughout your system. Welcome to the Engage Truth Show. I'm Caleb Harrelson, your host, and you can find us on, on many platforms on Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and we're so excited that you can join us today on the Engage Truth Show, and we really hope that you will engage with the truth, engage with the data, and we're going to also interact with popular objections regularly on this show. And the issue that we're dealing with today is the issue of dinosaurs and the Bible, particularly the soft tissue findings um, that we're finding in dinosaur bones, particularly uh, Dr. Mark Armitage. We're going to have him on today as our special guest. And uh, we're so excited to welcome you on the show today, Dr. Armitage. How are you Thank doing you. today? I'm doing great. Good to be with you. Oh, good. Well, it's so good to have you. And I'm so excited just for our listeners and viewers of our show to interact with some of the excellent research that you're doing. Um, so maybe you can uh, just share with us a little bit about your background and what led you to this point of starting the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Institute. Okay, well, it's a, it's a lengthy story, so I'll try to uh, yeah. compact it. But essentially, um, I got bit by the microscope bug as a teenager, as a troubled teenager growing up in a military family. And we lived in Puerto Rico, actually. I was there uh, for about 12 years. But um, I was a troubled youth and uh, did love science. I was really uh, good in science in school. And so my dad packed me up and flew me all the way to Maine. And I stayed uh, on off the coast of Portland, Maine, on Great Diamond Island, which was the site of the National Youth Science Foundation. They had a summer laboratory, a marine laboratory, uh, off the coast of Maine. And so we used microscopes. That was my first exposure to microscopes. And of course, I, I got infected with the microscope bug. And uh, ever since then, I've been playing with microscopes. So I, I had a wonderful career with Carl Zeiss and with Olympus and Reichert. I uh, spent about 45 years uh, in microscope repair and then sales uh, and then training. Uh, and then I got into academia. I went back and got my master's degree and my doctorate and, um, and taught in academia for about 12 years. And uh, you might remember that uh, in 2012, I got invited to go on a dinosaur dig, which I'd always wanted to go on because I was trained in soft tissue processing. I was a soft tissue processing expert. And at the time I was running a, a million dollar laboratory at Cal State University Northridge. And I got invited to go on a dig in 2012 to Montana. We found this 48 inch long triceratops horn uh, which has made news all around the world. We found this beautiful, soft, stretchy tissue in it. And you can see those videos on our website, distry.org. But uh, that got me fired from the state university. And that turned into a lawsuit, which we ended up winning. And then I, I moved away from Los Angeles and came up uh, to Washington State. I was pretty sick when I got here. I had a condition called trigeminal neuralgia. I had a blood vessel wrapped around uh, a nerve coming off my brain stem. So I had to have brain stem surgery uh, to fix that. And then I had open heart surgery in the same year. So 2019 was a tough year. But no, I, I, uh, I had started this work with the Creation Research Society and uh, we got published. I published uh, uh, the paper in Acta Histochemica. Uh, and uh, this is an international journal of cells and tissues. And that, of course, is what uh, started the process where I was uh, terminated from the university. But uh, since then, we've had some seven publications. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting, the things that we're uncovering and finding. We're even finding nerves. So we can talk about those things if you want. But I started DISTRI because the work needed to be done. And no one was doing the work, uh, at least uh, uh, from a non-evolutionist point of view. There are several labs doing the work. But 
this is a this is a tough area of study. It can be a career killer because uh, a lot of academic institutions are not interested in hearing about dinosaur soft tissue, and they will eliminate you from their program if you delve into this. So a lot of researchers st are staying away from it. But we decided to start an institution. Uh, we're a scientific institution. We're a nonprofit, and so we operate a little differently. We uh, we do the work, we publish, and then we go present at scientific meetings and other places. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is how things have come together over the last 45 years. Oh, that's so exciting. And thanks for sharing that with us. I think it's so helpful for our viewers just understanding some of your background. And I think from reading some of your bios, um, am I understanding it right that you were an evolutionist up until about your senior year of college? Is that right? Yeah, I was. Uh, and I was really troubled about it. Uh, I was not a Christian. I didn't get saved until my junior year of college. And, and at that time, uh, I was an evolutionist. I was trained in evolution at the University of Florida. And I just kind of stuffed it deep down inside because mm. I couldn't answer the questions. You know, I was reading scripture and it was telling me that the Lord spoke and things happened uh, during creation week. And I thought, wow, that's just so different from my training. And so I just kind of suppressed all those feelings. Uh, but I did start reading the scriptures and trying to understand them and get a feel for them. And then when I found creation materials uh, and started reading those, I realized, wow, there's a whole lot of information here that I have not been taught or exposed to. So I, I just dove into it and I started reading as much as I could. And, and, it, and it helped me to bridge that gap. But then as a microscopist, I decided I'm going to go out and see if these things are true, like radio halos and things like that. And I did a lot of work on my own, just trying to understand this stuff. And finally, I was convinced, wow, the scripture really is reliable. It really is true. The things that we find in science totally support uh, a young earth, the creation week, not so long ago. So um, it was a process. And, and I would I would encourage you if you're if you have doubts and, uh, you know, don't don't run away from your doubts. Do your study. Do your work. You know, the Bible says uh, uh, those people that Paul preached to, the Bereans, they went home and they studied the scriptures all night to see if what Paul was saying was true. And I would encourage you to do that. Become invested in your own education and don't just believe whatever you're being told. Uh, go find it out for yourself. That's what I did. Yeah, I think that's so helpful. As I know, I struggled a lot with these similar questions and I'm still learning but I think there's such a helpful distinction between um, there's doubt that can lead towards deeper levels of faith. Yeah. And then there's a doubt that really sometimes, if we're honest, it ends up really being an unbelief that we're looking for an excuse. And I, I tend to see people in this category. They don't really want to engage with the material. They just want to perhaps just Google like why creationism is ridiculous. And but they're not really looking at good material on that topic yeah, look, at, at our core we're all lazy okay let's yeah, yeah. we're all lazy uh nobody really likes to do hard work uh, i don't mind hard work i'll do it but yeah basically, i'm lazy so yeah. uh, it, it's a decision it's a choice um and you have to you have to understand that this is an eternal choice that you're making uh, i got to the point where when i was reading scripture it was so different from the uh evolutionary tale that I was being told um, that it was shocking. And, and I, I found that I got to a point where I realized, you know, a lot of times I say to God, you show me God and I'll believe, you know, mm. give, me a, give me a sign, right? What was it that they always used to say to Jesus? Show us a sign, right? Yeah. That way you show me God and I'll believe it. Then I came to realize God was saying to me, Mark, you trust me and I will show you. And I'm telling you, he showed me in spades. So all the discoveries we're making, the fact that we're finding nerves, you know, they're putting us on the covers of journals, okay? God is proving to me that he is worth having faith in and Amen. walking by faith. And so it gets easier over time. At first, you know, it's uncomfortable. Why? You're not used to it. We're used to being our own, uh, you know, in charge of our own destiny, as it were, which is a fallacy. You're not in charge of your own destiny unless you choose the right choice, which is choose life, choose Christ. Now, a lot of people are afraid because they figure, you know, Christian life is so restrictive. You know, I'm going to have to give up all these things that I enjoy doing. Actually, what you're going to realize is all those things you're doing are harmful. Mm. <laughs> Number one, they're separating you from God. And, uh, and there's nothing like having a relationship 
with the creator of everything. I mean, to know that this person who is beyond our wildest dreams and imagination cares about me, cares about you as a person and how you're feeling. Uh, wow, that changes everything. So uh, this journey began with small steps. Everybody's got to start and walk the same way. It's a pathway that you walk your entire life. I'm just a little further down the path than you. So get on the path. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. And I, I think it's it's so encouraging for all of us to hear that. And I believe it was, I want to say it was uh, Sir Isaac Newton who said all of his discoveries were a direct answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's probably something that you would heartily agree with as well. I would, I would and, absolutely. And in yeah. what what we're, I think we're seeing with um, uh, Distri and, and many creationist organizations that um, – that Christianity is total truth for all of reality. It's not just a spiritual truth. It's it's grounded in God act in history. He acted in history. He created the world. There was a flood. Um, Jesus literally uh, lived, died, and rose again. And yes, the Bible is not a science textbook, but when it hits on issues of science and history, I do believe it's accurate. It's perfectly and, accurate. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the other thing is you have to realize everything around you is going to burn. All these beautiful microscopes, they're all going to burn. Everything's going to burn in this final judgment, which Second Peter 3 talks about. Mm -hmm. The earth has been judged. The evidence is in the flood. And what we're finding in every single bone, every single dig, are not only soft tissues, but we're finding blood clots throughout. Wow. Most of the bones that we work on uh, have blood clots, even very old ones. For example, this is a triceratops. I don't know if you can see that very well. That's a thin section of a triceratops bone. So we put it on a slide and then we put it under the microscope and these things are full of blood clots. I've got a picture of some here. We published this uh, earlier last year and we, we studied seven different individuals and we looked at the blood clots under regular microscopy, which are the two pictures on the top up here. But below that's UV, we have hit these blood clots with ultraviolet light and they're glowing blue. What? The iron in the clots uh, is still there. It never left the, the vessel canals. So it didn't go out into the tissues. It's still in the canals and all the iron in there is glowing UV under our UV microscope. Your camera's backwards, so I have to point this way. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and then the nerves. We're, we're, we started with finding nerves in a triceratops condyle, which is the bone at the base of the skull, which lets the triceratops rotate his head. That big ball-shaped condyle, we dissolved that and found nerves in it. We published that, and they put it on the cover of the journal. So we're, we're now being recognized for the work, which I think is very rewarding. But more importantly, this is for everybody to know. This is not something that only a few people should know about. The whole world needs to know that all of these creatures and all of these deposits have blood clots in them. They have nerves in them. Therefore, they cannot be old and they must have drowned because they have clots. That, that's a condition, that's a known medical condition called DIC. And when you drown, if you die in drowning, all your blood clots throughout your system. Oh, that's incredible. That's so exciting. And so I want to unpack some of this um, a in a little more detail in a bit, but also for our listeners who may be thinking, okay, but what's the big deal about dinosaur soft tissue? I mean, I can take for granted that I understand the implications. You understand. And so many of our viewers, they kind of range from the those who, who love this topic and others who are just getting exposed to it. And it's it's really exciting, the range of viewers we have um, on my show here. And maybe we can explain briefly the theological and scientific implications. Like, what's such a, why is this such a big deal? Of course, a lot of the literature, they, they have um, a time period for when the dinosaurs um, supposedly went extinct around what 65 million years and and some of the bones you're excavating and researching on um you have uh, even older on um, the the secular um, publications on that so can you explain some more like why is this so significant well first of all to find soft tissue and anything that's supposed to be 65 68 70 million years old is stunning it's astounding it's astonishing it's shocking uh, as I mentioned before, I was trained as a soft tissue processing expert 
uh, as a biologist and a microscopist. I spent about 45 years uh, in, in microscopy, both in academia and out in the marketplace. Um, and so all of my training, all of my education, all of my experience tells me that soft tissue doesn't last. And, and especially in the soil, the soil is full of microorganisms and nematodes and ciliates and all kinds of things that are designed bacteria to break down these things. They're decomposers, fungal bodies. Uh, they're all designed uh, to break down these things in the soil. And so for all of the soft tissue to be in the soil uh, for even a thousand years to me is astonishing uh, that it's still there. So no, it, it begs it begs young specimens. It begs the whole question of how old these are. They cannot possibly be old because of the kinds of tissues, even fats. We're finding fats, lipids in some of these specimens. And that's impossible. It's impossible for this stuff to be here even a thousand years, let alone 10,000 or a million, you know, or 68 million. It's incomprehensible. So that, first of all, the average person, the common person on the street knows if I throw a peanut butter and jelly sandwich into my backyard and, and watch what happens over a week, that stuff's going to go away. We know soft tissue goes away. Uh, one of our fish dies in an aquarium. You know, it starts to break down right away. It flows to the surface and it just falls apart. So we know this innately. So first of all, just to have soft tissue in specimens this old is a shocker. Now, uh, some of our colleagues are trying to promote the idea that these things are rare. Well, like I said, every bone every day, every bone every day has clots in it and has soft tissues in it. So, and we've dug into the Permian now. We went to Oklahoma in May and we dug, uh, well, we didn't really even have to dig. We found specimens right on the surface of the uh, aquatic plane there, the fluvial plane. And this, this is a piece of Dimetrodon femur and we thin sectioned this. And it's also full of clots. Now, this, this was fully, fully permineralized. In other words, uh, because it was in solutions which have silica and other uh, compounds in it, this thing turned to rock. So it's no longer bone. But all the, uh, the tissues and stuff are preserved inside of that. And we can see those when we thin slice them very thin and put them under the microscope. So even in the deepest specimens, even in the oldest supposedly specimens, that we're uh, digging into, we're finding these conditions. Wow, that's really exciting. And so we we have a big issue with the paradigm here. If they're assuming the deep time and they're assuming the layers um, are laid down um, millions of years ago, well, there's there's problem with the, the organic material that you're finding. And that, that kind of throws in a question many other assumptions with dating methods as well. But then theologically, as you've mentioned that it really seems to add up and ex be explained better that they were laid down um, during the global catastrophic flood. And I think, go ahead. Yeah, no, it makes it makes more sense to, um, to realize that these layers that we're looking at were laid down pretty rapidly and concurrently. So um, no, th there's no question there. You mentioned theologically. Well, here's, here's the point that I came to. Uh, as I struggled with scripture and the science that I was being taught, um, how do those, how do you reconcile those? And uh, I came to the point where I realized part of my trust in Jesus means trusting what he says. Hmm. And when he says in Matthew and in Mark, at the beginning of creation, the creator made them male and female. That kind of cemented it for me. Um, if God created Adam and Eve at the beginning of creation, well, that's creation week, and that means it wasn't so long ago because of all the evidence we're finding. So it really came down to whether or not I was going to trust Jesus at his word because I didn't want to stand in front of him on the day of judgment and have to explain myself and, and give him the reasons why I couldn't believe in him. Believe me, that's not going to go well for people who are going to argue that in front of Jesus. So yeah. you know, it's far easier uh, to, to go ahead and accept it now, to trust him, and like I say, it has just opened up this whole world for me, but based on my trust in him, uh, as you, you, know, you quoted, I believe it was Isaac Newton, exactly right. All of those discoveries, I believe, have come about through prayer and seeking him. So we've done the hard work. Doesn't mean you can just sit there and it'll fall on your head like an apple and, you know, yeah. <laughs> give you all the details. You got to go out and do the hard work. But um, 
No, I think he's rewarding that. And I, I think he will reward those of us who do say on this side of the veil, I trust you, Lord, in spite of what all these people say, in spite of being thrown out of work for believing what I believe. And, and CSUN, Cal State Northridge was not the first job I lost for my mm. position in Genesis. That's like the fifth job that I've lost for that. And so, you know, it kind of wrecked my whole career. But what it did is it launched me into this opportunity to go out and share with people. And I, I've always maintained that the best way to teach a PhD is to train a 13-year-old and let them go teach them. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, exciting. And it's a good way to break it down is that we're really looking at the authority of Jesus and his words. And, you know, that was a key part for myself because I was a believer, but I really struggled with thinking through the issues scientifically and theologically. And I, for me, it was a big turning point. I saw the evidence for the flood and the geologic layers. And I do a lot of episodes interviewing geologists. And um, then I started seeing dinosaur soft tissue. And then I understood, as you said, Jesus said in the beginning, second Peter three, um, four through six around there says um, that people deny the creation of the world and the flood. And that's yeah. connected with them denying the return of Jesus. Yeah. And so um, Christians who would try to um, deny the flood and how that fits in with history are really rejecting the words of scripture itself. And all scripture is God breathed. So they're ultimately all scripture is Jesus's words because he's God. Yeah. And it, it may not impact your salvation. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know. I'm not God. So I'm not making those decisions. But I just know that he says in scripture that I am to believe him, to follow him, to not question him. And, and so you might make it into heaven by even after questioning Jesus during your whole life. But I wouldn't want to be you sitting in front of him, to be honest with you, because I love him. And, and when you love someone, when you're a friend to someone, you don't distrust what they say to you. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder how he feels. How does he, how would you feel, you know, if your spouse or your best friend or somebody just questioned everything you said on a particular subject, how long would you stay friends with that person? Now, the Lord, he's got the biggest heart in the universe, okay? He's got the most mercy in the universe, and he wants to give his mercy to us. Uh, he wants to save us from our condition, and we're messed up. We're lost, okay? We are, we are in sin, and because we're in sin, we're slaves to sin, and that slavery is going to drag you into hell unless you turn it over to Christ and say, I can't do it. I need you, I need saving, I need your power and your strength, and I need your mercy. Mm. If you don't do that, uh, you're a fool, the Bible says. And you have the right to be a fool. You have the right to drag that into eternity. But, man, I wouldn't want to be you on that day. Yeah, and I think that ends up coming into us, leading into unbelief when we say don't trust it, don't trust God's word here and here. It tends to lead into unbelief. And Certainly, yeah. like there was a point where I was really struggling in my walk. And I'm not going to say that I was unsaved, but I was really struggling when I was um, distrusting a lot of God's word. Um, and I, I like the way the Chicago statement of inerrancy puts it that you can deny inerrancy and still be saved, but not without serious detriment to the health of your faith. It's described some way like that. And I think yeah. in a similar way, like obviously I believe like the five souls were saved by faith alone, Christ alone and grace alone. And it's not faith plus believing a certain age of the earth or Christ plus believing that. But I think it is a foundational doctrine that does affect other things and um, affect the reason that Jesus came to pay for the wages of sin. And we don't want to have sin and death before um, Adam and Eve are in the world. And that's that is foundational. It is foundational. Most Christians don't understand that if you believe in deep time, if you accept deep time, you're accepting not only millions of years, but millions and billions of death. Yeah. Uh, before Adam and Eve. And so that goes against scripture because Jesus taught, Paul taught very specifically that sin and death entered through a man, through Adam and Eve. So no, look, all the information is there. Uh, we have we have a clear choice to make and you can choose who you want to listen to. Um, frankly, I listened to the evolutionists for, for most of my academic career, uh, my formative academic career, and it, it nearly uh, derailed me completely. Um, so, yeah, I would encourage you to, to just investigate for yourself. Look, you don't have to throw your brain out to become a Christian. 
you know? In fact, it, it takes more intellect, I think, that the stories about evolution in deep time are so shallow. Yeah, They're so shallow. They're not well thought out. And, and really, I believe these folks have painted themselves in a corner by lifting up dinosaurs so high to where the whole world adores them and promoting the fact that they're so old, you know, they should be dust by now, but they're not. Or they're rock. Most of the bones we pull out of the ground are not rock. They're still bones. They can still be dissolved with the same exact protocols that are being used in hospitals today, all around the country, all around the world. Hospitals are dissolving bone to get to the soft tissues in them. We're using the same exact protocol. So they're not rock, they're bone. So no, I, I, I think this is something you have to grapple with, grapple with because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does not do that and leads other people astray, they'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you want to be called least for the rest of eternity, hey, that's on you. I don't want to be called the least, so I'm going to trust and I'm going to walk in faith and trust him. Even if I don't understand it, even if inside I don't really agree with it, I'm going to trust him because why? There's enough evidence to prove to me that God exists that he made and designed me, that he owns me, and that he's going to save me in the, in the end. Amen. And I, I really think it's it's never necessary, if not really a, a lack of evidence. I, as you mentioned, like people trying to demand God give them a sign. Well, it's self-evident. <laughs> there is a sign. There's a sign everywhere. And it's it's more the matter of just suppressing the truth. And then, unfortunately, some Christians take, well, the self-evident nature of, of God's revelation and creation and um um, the ability to think and reason that we have a soul and so on that they think, well, then we don't need to think through these issues. No, I, I do think it's helpful to think through it because it's it's part of bringing all things, all of our thoughts into subjection to the Lord Jesus. And what are all of our thoughts? Well, our thoughts about scripture, certainly, but our thoughts about every subject, our thoughts about geology, our thoughts about all those things. And of course, people are want to always rebut with, but this is not a science textbook. Yes, I know. But how do we think of it to the glory of God in light of history and how he has acted in history? And I think that's really helpful because um, one of my favorite subjects, as I mentioned, geology and dinosaur bones, is when I when I see things like your research um, and I'm watching some of the videos and I'm, I'm hearing about Dr. Snelling's phenomenal research about folded layers in the Grand Canyon um, and how they were folded um, when they were still um, soft and um, wet and I, and I, for me that's a moment of worship though it's not just a um, oh I'm feeling my head it leads me to humility that when I was in the Grand Canyon last May I wasn't just looking at a rock um, the Great Unconformity I was looking at the beginning of God's judgment and and I'm no doubt that's similar with you and so when I think uh, when we work through some of these issues and I think it can be a moment of worship and a moment of intellectual rigor uh, of really honoring the Lord and taking captive every thought. So what I want to do at this point, I know if we still have some of those, I, have, I know on occasion we have um, some uh, people who are not persuaded by our position and want to think through what are we saying, what's the position, and I hope that you're still listening. And I hope you'll engage with this next section because we're going to try to interact with some of the pushback to your research. And I know with Dr. Brian Thomas and Dr. Kevin Anderson, they're also um, really leading in this field and many other scientists I'm, I'm sure I've failed to mention, but... Um, there are, there are many people who have proposed different um, ideas, and you've referred to them already, of, well, maybe the soft tissue um, has been preserved in some um, form um, or another. And one article that uh, I'm going to quote from some, and I know you're familiar with the author, uh, Dr. Philip Center, and um, you, he, uh, mentioned, he mentioned earlier that you're finding original bones. Is that correct? Yes. That's not mineralized. Correct. And one thing I was when you mentioned that it was interesting to me because uh, he was saying in one of his articles that here I'll quote it. He says fossilization is by definition long term preservation. So to use the word unfossilized for the bones and their soft tissue, which unquestionably have undergone long term preservation, makes no sense. If the bones were indeed not fossilized, they'd now be non existent. Is his quotes. Well, uh, that's, it's an interesting uh, comment. I think he's uh, mixing some things up there because he is correct that the term fossilization does, it's really a technical term that relates to things that are buried in the ground. I mean, essentially it doesn't, 
doesn't mean they're permineralized. And we're finding that most of them are not permineralized. They're still bone. Uh, so the term fossilization or fossil uh, really has to do with the location of the specimen, the fact that it's been in the ground long term, things like that. Permineralization is probably the more accurate term for the process by which biological materials, molecules are exchanged with minerals. And so that's mineralization. Uh, and we do see that these, these uh, dimetrodon uh, bones, the jaw, the teeth, the femurs and stuff that we found, these are solid rock. Uh, but most of the stuff that we dig out of the ground are not. In fact, a lot of the Permian limbs that we look at uh, and, and your readers, your subscribers can look up uh, a term called fissure fills, F-I-S-S-U-R-E-F-I-L-L-S, fissure fills, Oklahoma. This is a very highly concentrated site uh, in Oklahoma where most of the world's Permian specimens are located. Now, when you think about the Permian, you have to think all the way back 300 million years ago to when the earth, uh, all the land masses were in one, one supercontinent. Right, and over time those things drifted, right? And so, uh, so Montana and Oklahoma traveled 8,000 miles you know, away from Pangaea over this 300 million year period and the continents are resting where they are today according to that scenario. Yet these bones are pristine and not only do they not have any scratch marks or scrape marks or scuff marks uh, or abrasions or cracks, uh, many of them are crack free, but they're also full of nerves. And so we're pulling nerves now out of Permian limbs from the fissure fills. And what's really cool is that we're in collaboration with the Oklahoma Museum of, of Natural History and they're supplying some of these bones that we destroy. So uh, that's hard for a paleontologist to do, to give up a bone knowing that it's gonna be destroyed, but we have to, we have to decalcify them in order to pull the nerves out of them. But we are finding this now in Permian. So, um, I don't remember your first question. Usually I ramble when I get a question. So did I answer your question properly? Yes. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And and uh, you're, we're going to be doing several more videos, especially when you come to El Paso. And if um, one of our viewers thinks we didn't address it, maybe we'll come back to it as well. But uh, I want to, um, of course, well, I wanted to hit on Dr. Center because I you mentioned Dr. Center in his article, sure. which sure. I've been a biology teacher, wasn't it? Uh, and, and he discusses uh, my work, not all of it, uh, and, and several other works uh, by creationists. Um, yeah. And uh, I wrote to him after I read the article because I realized he had not included any of the work subsequent to the paper that was published in 2013 in Acta Histochemica. I was glad he included that one. But we've published since then in Microscopy Today, as I mentioned, we've got four publications in Microscopy Today, and we have a brand new paper that's going to be published this week, actually, in Microscopy Today on clots in Dimetrodon. So um, I, I wrote to him and I mentioned, hey, I think you kind of did your readers a disservice because you weren't comprehensive in your literature search. And I sent him the papers and we started a dialogue and he's very interested to, uh, to receive the papers once they're published as we continue. So I, I'm interested in building bridges with folks like this because he is a forensic scientist and uh, forensics, as you know, is a study uh, a part of forensics is the study of decaying bodies. And so there's a treasure trove of information that they've collected over the decades in forensic science. So this would be a wonderful ally uh, once he realizes the extent to which we're finding things. And one of his comments in the paper uh, related to preservation, because he uses that term preservation. That's an interesting term because preservation means that it's still here. It's It's been here across all that time and it's still here so it was preserved now was that some mechanical thing that preserved it or was it preserved just because of the site that it was located in or you know what what are the mechanisms for preservation and this is what they've tried to provide they, they scientists have to explain the presence of these things and so we come up with uh with uh you know things that might uh explain how these things were preserved. Because as I mentioned, there's microbes in the soil, bacteria, protists, fungal bodies, there's trematodes, nematodes, all kinds of things that go after this soft tissue uh, vociferously. And so if, if this was in the ground for 60 million years, we shouldn't find anything related to soft tissue. And yet every bone every day, as I've said. So 
he did mention the fact that, uh, and this is observed, that sometimes there's a there's a thin mineral encrustation around some of these tissues, and that's true. I've removed blood vessels uh, from some of these specimens, and they're encrusted. They're they're encrusted on the outside with mineral encrustation. So, how much of that actual a vessel is still there. Well, that remains to be determined. But if you look at the videos on our website, you'll see that stretchy fiber or bone. And that made the film is Genesis History. If you saw that movie is Genesis History. Well, that that stretchy bone, all I did was fracture open the horn and peel it away. And we have a video on our website that shows me peeling some of the stuff off the bone. So I didn't do anything to that bone other than crack it open and pull that sheet out. I put it in a fixative to preserve it, uh, and it had cells in it. I thin sectioned it, and it made the cover of American Laboratory because it was full of cells. So that stretchy stuff, it's a it's a fibrinor carpet of collagen with all the cells inside. So no, this is shocking. This stuff shouldn't be there. And uh, the more collaboration we have on this, the better. Yeah, that was really exciting. And again, I would encourage all of our viewers and listeners to check out the movie as Genesis history. I know they're coming out with the second one, I think sometime later this year. So I'm real excited to, to look at that one as well. And you know, this, this article, um, I, I appreciate too about this is it doesn't seem to have the typical ad hominems um, that I see in most um, articles that try to respond to um, biblical creationist, young earth creationist position. And this one, again, for those uh, listeners, um, it's, it's trying to, it, 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 my understanding is providing a response or to um, our perspective and uh, understanding that these um, soft tissues could not have lasted millions of years. His title is Preservation of Soft Tissue in Dinosaur Bones, Compatibility with an Age of Millions of Years. And near the end of the article, um, he, of course, cites yourself, Dr. Armitage, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Anderson, and, and many other um, creation uh, scientists and um, he has the last section is called Young Earth Creationist Distortions. It says uh, Young Earth Creationist authors offer a different answer to the question of how cells and soft tissues have survived. In the dinosaur bones in question, the bones are young, just thousands instead of millions of years old, as we've articulated. Um, however, you know, after he quotes the links to the sources, he says, it's a non-answer. Cells and blood vessels and bone can decay within a few days. If some mechanism of preservation can persist long enough to counteract that tendency for thousands of years, why would it not be expected to continue to persist? Well, yeah, most physical chemists and uh, anybody who's done any work in taphonomy, which is the formation, trying try to make a fossil, will tell you, no, uh, some of these tissues are impossible to preserve. They, they, when I was trained in electron microscopy, we were we were taught to take the tissues that we were interested in and we process them through all of the uh, protocols. You have to put them through a fixative and then you have to wash them and dehydrate them through a graded series of alcohols. And then uh, you do further things from that point. You might embed them in a polymer and then thin section them or put them under an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope. But all of that process has to be done on ice. So we were trained to go get a big bucket of ice, take your vials, put your solutions in them, put them in the ice, uh, take your vials, put your tissues in them, put them in the ice, and keep everything at four degrees centigrade the whole time you're processing them. Well, this is completely different from the conditions in Hell Creek, Montana, where we dug the, the Triceratops horn out, and we dug the condyle out, and the frill, and the ribs, and all this stuff that we've examined. And, um, no, I mean, the conditions are so different. E even the, the experiment that they tried to conduct, and they did it twice, they tried to conduct an iron preservation experiment, and they did it in an air-conditioned laboratory on a bench with no microorganisms and no, you know, we, we, when, we, when we found the horn, we sent a piece in it for what's called a, a DNA blast analysis, and that, that's just a quick analysis to see how many different organisms you might have in your sample. And we had the DNA of 60 different organisms in our sample, okay? And yet this soft, stretchy stuff and the nerves, everything's still there. So no, that we, we know as microscopists, we know soft tissues must be preserved quickly in cold conditions 
in order for all that structure to remain. Now, in the paper on the nerves, uh, I thin sectioned these. I actually took one nerve and I put it on an ultra microtome, which is a machine that makes thin sections. And I actually cut. I took the nerve. This is backwards. I have to figure out. So there's the nerve, and I thin sectioned it. And you can see all these sections in here show the different structure inside the nerve. And I'm pointing to that with arrows. So a lot of the structure is still there. Uh, and, and we point this out in our publication. So in order for that structure to be there, it had to be preserved by some kind of mechanism in order to explain it scientifically. Um, or something else was involved in its preservation because it's still there. So what is that preservation mechanism? I don't know. I can't think of one, uh, especially with the nerves. The iron preservation theory does not explain the presence of nerves because these are surrounded in fats. So I don't know. People ask me, how can this stuff still be there? The only explanation I have is that God somehow preserved it because nothing that is... Uh, scientifically offered as a pre preservation mechanism works. Yeah, that's so interesting. I had a student at a public school I presented. Um, I think it was probably a picture of one of your research uh, um, or Dr. Thomas. I, I shared on a slide at a, a Christian club and the student said, there's there's no way it could, should even exist a week. <laughs> uh, he just thought it couldn't exist um, very long at all. But I mean, as you said, it, it can be preserved for some time period. We're, we're talking about several thousand years and he thought there's no way it would still be around um and so he he didn't even believe me <laughs> for one yeah, i call them impossible pictures because they are they, this stuff shouldn't be there but it's everywhere it's everywhere and, and i made the prediction back in 2012 uh after discovering the horn that this is going to be the norm rather than the exception and that's proved true yeah it's it's so fascinating um i look pick up more on uh, related to the iron um, preservation view presented here by Dr. Center. He said, our conclusion um, that we're presenting is, uh, he says it's opposed by three important facts that are pointed out in the very references uh, that Demessa and Badro um, cite and he lists several sources. And he says in the article here, and we'll link it in the description in the YouTube video as well. Um, Although some individual amino acids and amino acid pairs may be more unstable than others, the longer amino acid sequences that include those amino acids and pairs can counteract those instabilities. As a result, the three-dimensional structures of a protein can protect it, at least for a time, from the reactions um, that Damasa and Bredro list, even in an aqueous environment within cells. And so that was one of the three, I believe, um, rebuttals he puts forth. Right. What Demasa and Boudreau showed is that uh, these, uh, okay, in the iron preservation theory, uh, the story goes that Fenton reactions, which are well known to science, they're highly destructive, they're highly oxidative. I've quoted uh, several papers uh, in my work showing that this stuff chews up tissue like Pac-Man. Now they acknowledge that. They'll say, okay, uh, we know that the hydroxyls that are formed and the peroxyls that are formed, which are highly oxidative, do go through and destroy tissue. Uh, we acknowledge that. But in that destruction, there is some uh, sort of uh, uh, strengthening or twisting or, you know, these links are formed as a result of these hydroxyls and peroxyls between different proteins. The thing about proteins is they're, if you unravel them, they're like a long train of cars. It's like a long train of all these cars that are connected together. And each one of those has a link between them. And so you're begging for the iron to basically preserve every single link in that protein chain, which is impossible. It cannot possibly do that. So even though some of the links might be strengthened by twisting and that sort of thing, um, the rest of the links are not supported and they're gonna fall apart. So even if one little part is is fixed, as it were, they 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 compare it to fixation in formaldehyde, which is a, a, a chemical that we use in biology. We call it formalin to stabilize tissues. We cross-link all the proteins. But they're saying that the Fenton reactions producing the hydroxyls and the peroxyls would go in and act the same way as a fixative and harden these things. Now, they only discussed vessels. And this is what everybody misses. They only discussed the possibility of Fenton reactions 
cross-linking proteins in vessels. They didn't talk about veins. They didn't talk about vein valves. They didn't talk about nerves. They didn't talk about all the other tissues that obviously would just be chewed up by Fenton reactions. So no, Fenton reactions are highly destructive. And you know it may be probable that they would uh, preserve some of the vessels, but I don't see how they could preserve them all. And they cannot preserve, Fenton reactions cannot preserve cells. Uh, we've shown beautiful cells in our papers. I'll see if I can find it here. We found beautiful cells that we liberated from these bones. Um, well, I'm not finding the right uh, journal, but they even, oh yes, here it is. So here we go. All right, that's, that's a liberated cell. This guy right here, that's liberated. It's in an aqueous solution. You can see all the beautiful philopodia, the little legs sticking off of it. Those should not be here. And, and those would be chewed up completely by hydroxyls and peroxyls. The cells would not survive. But what we have shown is that the, the clots, the iron, stayed in the canals. It didn't go into the tissues. Remember, I showed you this picture. These are the blood canals. That's a canal, and it's full of a blood clot. And it glows in, in UV, like I showed you before. So it didn't go out into the tissues. The iron stayed in the canals. But yeah, no, I, I think there's enough uh, um, objections that we could raise, scientific objections, uh, which uh, you know prove or show that work to be flawed on many levels. And again, it's one thing to have theoretical models, but to go out in the field and find this over and over and over and over and over and over and over, come on, uh, Fenton reactions aren't that powerful. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think that'll serve our listeners and viewers well of um, just how you broke that down. And I, I haven't heard that um, explained that way. So thank you. And um, I was so excited when I saw just your videos on dystry about the blood clots, because if is that, as you said, we're finding the blood clots everywhere too, or? Everywhere. That's incredible. Everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what's amazing when I saw that, I was like, why does this video not have a billion views and and i know that's what you want to get all of this information out to the world and we do um, we give it all away in fact we publish books uh we've got uh two books old stretchy the dinosaur bone cell and uh you can get those for free you can download them or it, yeah, when, when we go like for example when we come to el paso every single student is going to get copies of our books and oh, great. Got one, yeah we got a new one in press so now we give everything away we Look, Jesus didn't sell anything. We're not going to sell anything. We want to give it all away. This is for the whole world to know. Uh, people are shocked. When, when I talk to people on the street, I tell them, we're finding nerves in dinosaur bones. They're like, no way. Yes way. And then we share with them how prevalent it is and what this really means. And it, I just tell people straight up, the flood was real. And they'll go, yeah, it was. So it's been amazing. We travel around the country. Uh, it's so fun because we'll tell them what we're doing and, and, you know, we start sharing with them. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that. And we just say, can we pray with you? And we pray with them right on the spot and uh, in, in front of others. And, and it's just it's so neat to be able to go out and do this and to have the positive attitude that, hey, we're finding stuff that really proves that this stuff is real. And you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. The Lord's going to take care of you. Just hang on to him. Amen. And I tell you, when I go out and do evangelism downtown El Paso or at UTEP, uh, when I talk with people about um, your research, uh, almost no one has heard about this. And I'm like, wait a, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, if you guys are going to be a higher education, everyone needs to know about this stuff. Yeah. And we're hope, we're hoping, Lord willing, to change that. And uh, we're praying for to get that that key detail arranged. Um, and we have several people working on that soon. And, and hopefully after I publish this, we'll uh, have some more uh, things worked out, but uh, where yeah, you? Yeah, so, because we got to go to uh, State College, Pennsylvania. In fact, that's where we proved out the concept of doing these labs. And I want everybody to know what we're doing. We just invested forty thousand dollars into twenty student microscopes. These are high quality instruments. We're gonna we're gonna take them out in the field, set up labs, and and we'll have labs of twenty students each. We can do three labs a day. We're taking it out across the country because we want to teach these kids. If we believe that if we teach all these kids what, what the truth is and they get into college, they're going to make a difference when they get into college. We also spoke at Penn State University while we were in state college. In fact, we were the first folks 
allowed to speak on campus since COVID began. So that was really a high honor to be able to speak, but it was streamed live and uh, we were getting comments from students all over the, the place saying they could not believe the stuff they were hearing and seeing. So no, th this needs to get out there that people need to know. And that's our goal. That's why we're going out with these labs and we're gonna teach as many people as possible the truth about what what is in the ground that we're walking on. We're literally walking on a soft tissue graveyard that encompasses the whole earth. It's like a cellophane wrapping of soft tissue around the earth that shows that God did judge the planet and he's going to judge it again. Amen. So as we're talking about our your El Paso tour, let me pull up here this slide about your upcoming El Paso visit. And we're going to have you real busy this week. And we're, we're so excited to have you, Dr. Armitage, come to El Paso. And uh, I wanted to pull this up here for all of our viewers to see um, just all the things you're going to be doing this week. Um, the last week of February 2022, um, we're, um, of course, going to have you start out at Chapel of the North Hills Church. And you're going to give a presentation that Sunday morning. And then we'll have an afternoon session. And this will be open to everyone who... Everyone. Uh, um, is it um, whether or not they're attending the labs? We we hope that those who are attending the labs will be able to attend this session. I'll give them a good preview of yes. why this matters and, and many things. And maybe um, if you want to explain some more about that that Sunday afternoon session, that may be helpful as well. Sure, perfect. Uh, now the Sunday uh, matinee presentation is for everybody, uh, particularly skeptics. If you're skeptical about this and you just want to come, you know, come and handle the bones. We bring bones. You can handle them. You can feel and see the different bones. Uh, and we do the whole presentation of all the research that we've done as sort of a general background. Now, this is good for the students because it kind of prepares them. And, and so a lot of their questions might be answered before they even get into the lab. Because uh, the lab is going to produce so many questions, believe me. It's amazing how these kids just take off with this stuff when we start the lab. So, But do come Sunday afternoon. Uh, especially if you're if you're a skeptic, if you're searching, maybe you're an evolutionist and, and you don't believe a word of this. I'm not going to bite you. I won't even yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in and, and just see, just open your mind and see what we're presenting. It's pure science. Uh, and that's all I present. When I do my presentations, I just present the science and then we do Q&A. And for 90 minutes, you won't believe the questions that come up. So uh, we'd love for everybody to come and uh, and definitely the students before you come to the lab, definitely come to the matinee presentation on Sunday. Yeah, I think both of those will be excellent for anyone who's able to attend and I will have all of the, the specific times and details posted on engageapologetics.com. You can find it on the main page that links also to this um, article that lists all the times and schedule. And then Monday night, it's not listed here, but this will be for the adult volunteer train um, those adult, adult volunteer uh, helpers with the labs. Uh, yes. We'll have some training that evening. And if we need to, we'll, we can add another time as well. And you'll find that on the website. And Tuesday, we're uh, in the process working out a uh, location on campus for you to present at UTEP. And uh, we'll publish that soon once that gets worked out. And then Wednesday and Friday, we're going to have the Dinosaur Bone Labs. And they're going to have, we're going to have three different times each of those days. Uh, that students can sign up and we'll have the registration form, as I mentioned, on the website. And uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more about the labs. Um, they're about three hours. Um, what should students expect? And I know it's ages seven and up where students can participate along with the adult helpers. Uh, what should so they girl, expect to happen girl, during that lab? Girl seven and up, boys nine and up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. right. Important distinction. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. You know, boys, boys at seven, they just don't have the attention span that girls at seven do. So, yeah, girls seven and up, boys nine and up. But there are three hour labs. The time goes quickly. You cannot believe how fast it goes by. But they will they will, will give a general uh, introduction of what they're going to expect to see. We're going to discuss the specimens. We have to talk about decalcification, how that works, how the uh, tissues are removed. Uh, from those uh, uh, decalcification containers, how they're preserved, how we make uh, uh, slides that will last, you know, forever. Uh, keep those, you know, in your slide collection. Uh, and, and then we'll get on the microscopes and we'll spend about an hour working with the dissecting microscopes. They'll be handling bones, uh, different kinds of bones. For example, uh, I like to show them 
bones that are permineralized uh, because they can see where uh, the the solutions. Now, now, you have to think with me about how this happens. When a bone gets buried, um, it's it's open to the environment, and if the iron environment is wet. If it's aqueous, it might have silica and calcite and other minerals dissolved in that water. So when these guys are, are you know, covered in these, these waters, these solutions, they infiltrate the bone because the bones are porous. In fact, one of the fun things we discover on the digs is if you find a rock that looks like a bone and you find a bone that looks like a rock, the best way to test them is to put them on your tongue because of all the holes all the canals, all the blood canals in there, they act like little capillaries and they will grab your tongue and pull it as you try to pull it out of your mouth. So you end up getting a lot of dirt in your mouth when you find out what's bone and what's not. Anyway, because they're porous, all those solutions will infiltrate in there and then it crystallizes. So I wanna show the students the bones that have the crystallized mineral inside the bone canals and then show them bones that have no mineralization in them and often you can see the blood products. It, it looks like uh, red dust uh, throughout the bones and in the canal. So they'll spend time on the dissecting microscope looking at those. They'll look at other specimens. Uh, we're gonna put uh, thin sections in front of them, let them see the clots in those. And then we go to the compound microscopes, which are what you see behind me here. Those are higher power and you work with slides at that point. And we will, we will have uh, dishes with solution from a decalcified dinosaur bone, and we'll pipette that out, put it on a slide, cover slip it, put it in the microscope, and let them look for cells and vessels and veins and even nerves. And so that'll be another hour of time under the microscope. A lot of students want photographs of the specimens that they work with so they can take those home and maybe write an article about it or something. So we have cameras on several of the microscopes. And so we take pictures and if they bring their thumb drive, we can give them all their pictures on their thumb drive. So no, it's, it's really fantastic. And what, what's really neat is that individual kids come up with different questions and different uh, situations. So it really is a lot of fun. There's a lot of give and take during the lab where everybody's learning all at the same time. So it's really a kick in the pants and uh, I get so energized by it, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. That is exciting. And man, I'm getting uh, amped up just hearing about this. And I can't wait uh, to see how the kids interact and, and to see uh, the bones myself as, as I help uh, assist any way I can. And of course, we'll have breaks during those three hour sessions. And um, yeah. I think the kids are going to be having so much fun. They're going to go, what? Time's up. <laughs> they won't want to take breaks. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's, it's going to be wonderful. And then we're going to top the week off with a, a, a conference at my home church at Coronado Baptist Church on Saturday morning, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, I'm so excited about that. We, we will have um, breakout classes for the elementary age kids in nursery. Um, so the adults and parents can attend the whole time in the 520 building um, with Dr. Armitage. And we're going to have lunch together and we're going to have several sessions and Q&A. And um, anything you want to say about the, the presentations on that Saturday conference? Uh, well, I guess my work is cut out for me because I have to produce uh, four different PowerPoints. One of the talks I put together was a new one called uh, Distry on the Bench. And, and I just brought out some of the hottest, newest research that's just hot off the bench. So I think that'll be a really fun presentation. So we'll do that one. You'll get to see some of the new exciting stuff. We'll talk about plans for digs. Another thing that we've offered is uh, an opportunity uh, for folks to come on digs with us. Now, yeah. we cannot take huge groups of people, obviously, uh, but uh, we're trying to create opportunities where students can come for a week or several days with their family and dig with us in Montana or in Colorado or Utah uh, or Oklahoma. We have several digs that we go to throughout the year. So that's another thing that we're working on. We're trying to figure out, you know, how to do this. Uh, but most of the dig operators are working with us and they they really like to have extra people come for the same uh, time period because that that these are all uh, mostly homeschool families or private Christian families who are trying to support their families on these ranches. So uh, this money helps them. And so when we get a larger group to come when we go to dig, it helps them financially. So we're just trying to pray through this and work through it and try to figure out ways to involve more people. 
that's exciting. I know if, if I can work it out, I'll be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, it sounds like that and going to the Grand Canyon with my buddy Nate Loper and Canyon Ministries and uh, places I would love to take myself and my family and friends. And Do you have those dates published yet or are you still working no, that no, out? No, no, no. Okay. That's still in its infancy. Okay, but, I thought so. Yeah, right now we are going to dig in Oklahoma probably in April, late April. Uh, Oklahoma can be pretty brutal in the summer, so we like to get there early. Uh, so there might be an opportunity there, but again, everything is just in its infancy, uh, in terms of that, uh, there was one other thing I was going to mention to you, but it slipped my mind, but no, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to work this in such a way where we travel to your location, where we come to you with all this equipment in this lab. So you don't have to pack up your family and drag them halfway across the country to have an experience. Uh, we believe we can do this nationally. Oh yes. Uh, the one thing we're really in need of is drivers to help us because we have to drive this rig from hmm. Seattle, Washington, clear across the country. So uh, we're all in. We're, we're Ruth and I are totally committed to this. Uh, and uh, but it'd be nice to have people who would be willing to fly in at our expense and help us drive the rig uh, to where we need to go. And then we'll fly them back home or, you know, work things out otherwise that way so that's a real need that we do have because we're we're both pushing 70 and this is getting hard for us it's a long drive and um for for this um coming down to el paso texas we're grateful that you guys can come down and and, and serve and minister to us and, and help educate our students and um we'll be praying for that and uh um as you see on here those watching that there are scholarships available we want our goal as the creation network in el paso is that Every student that wants to participate will be able to participate. And yeah. uh, we, we have labs Wednesday and Friday. Please mm -hmm. sign up so we can plan accordingly and, and do it soon. And we do have the deadlines listed on the website. And uh, we'll end the week with a great conference um, where everyone can attend that wants to attend. Um, and we'll, of course, have the Lord's Chicken, Chick-fil-A, um, provided that day. And um, I think it's going, going to be uh, excellent and that you guys can be a part of that. And uh, well, we're so excited, Dr. Armitage. And uh, is there any other way that we can be praying for you and your ministry and uh, your uh, uh, and district as well? Um, how, how can uh, people support you guys? Well, pray that, um, that we can be even more successful in our publication attempts. Um, uh, we, we, did, uh, we did find some resistance from some of the journals um, but it was interesting because they didn't really come out and say, well, we don't want to publish this for this or that or the other reason. Uh, one of the objections was you have too many references. And I thought, wow, okay. I thought the goal is to have as many possible references as you can. But uh, that was one rejection that we got. So we would like to be in more journals, I think. Um, the other thing we're hoping to do is to present. Uh, COVID has really messed up the whole scientific uh industry in terms of uh presentations you know conferences everything's been canceled or gone virtual and they're very low attended and and uh so we're hoping that in 22 we'll be able to present at some of these scientific meetings so pray for that that we can get published in different journal more journals and present at some of these meetings because we want our scientific colleagues to see this information too uh so that's a very important part of what we're trying to do I think that'll be so vital, as you mentioned, and we'll be in prayer for that. And I invite all our viewers and listeners to um, prayerfully consider um, how they may partner with you guys. I know that information is listed on your website. And, and please be in prayer for his El Paso tour. And I know you have many other events already scheduled this year. And, yeah, um, we're hoping to go to Michigan, Kansas City. For, I just got a call this morning from a guy in Fresno, uh, folks in uh, Ventura County and Orange County, California. Uh, yeah, I think the sky's the limit and we're all in. So we want to do this. Oh man, we're so excited for you guys and um, just going to continue to pray for God's strength and just uh, perseverance and focus as I know you have a lot of research and a lot of speaking engagements. And thank you so much, Dr. Armitage, for your time to help us engage with the truth of yeah. what um, God's world says in the rocks and in the bones and, and under the microscope. And so yeah. we're so excited and we invite our viewers and listeners that you would engage with this and um, leave any comments or messages, share, like, subscribe, and um, so other people can engage with the truth of what is what is out there and how it all points to God's word is true. And ultimately, you can trust in his son, who is the greater ark of salvation, 
who yeah. rescues us from our guilt and our judgment in Christ. Yeah. Uh, any closing thoughts you want to share with us, Dr. Armitage? Yeah, please visit our website, distree.org. Uh, you can you can download the books for free. Uh, we're a 501c3 organization. We don't ask for money, but uh, if you feel uh, led to help us, uh, we, we wouldn't turn it down. And uh, all of us are volunteers. None of us makes a dime at this. We're all donating our time and our treasure for this because we, we look, it's been a tough three years. People are discouraged. They're demoralized. School systems are in a mess. Schools have just gone down so badly. Uh, homeschoolers are struggling to find content and things to excite their children and give them hope and excitement for the future. So we're hoping to go out and, and uh, alleviate a lot of these things by going out and encouraging people and showing them this stuff. So if you can support us, great. Prayer is the most important thing. Uh, but uh, do visit the website. We also have a YouTube channel under Mark H. Armitage. If you go to YouTube and search that, uh, and there's a ton of videos there. So again, we give it all away. If you can use it in your talks or to share with your friends or neighbors or family, please do. That's the purpose of all this. We want you to use it. So take it and use it. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Armitage, for coming on the show today. And we look forward to having you here with us here in El Paso, Texas. Awesome. I can't wait.